Dick Cheney's world is a place where he controls the inner sanctum, doing and saying what he wants about American power. The government of the United States will not look the other way as threats accumulate against us. About business. We've not done any business in Iraq since the sanctions were imposed. About war. Time is not on our side that if we wait, uh, he will continue to develop ever more deadly capabilities. But in Dick Cheney's world, what he says is frequently more fiction than fact. Before 9-11, we tended to think of And what he does often seems to be motivated less by principle than power, self-interest, and money. And as we'll show you, his story tells a great deal about the world in which we live and how it got that way. Most uh, here. Let me assure you that had we the evidence to go after whether it was Halliburton or any other company, we certainly would. But there was no lack of evidence that Halliburton opposed the U.S. embargo. CEO Dick Cheney went to Calgary to tell oil men it was costing them money. Sometimes government can get in the way of sound policy. An example of the ineffectiveness of government mandates are U.S. unilateral economic sanctions. To find out how Cheney and Halliburton got around that problem, you've got to come to a tax haven like the Cayman Islands in the Caribbean. Here's why the Cayman Islands are important to Halliburton. The U.S. embargo against Iran has a loophole, a big one. It is illegal for American companies and American citizens to trade with Iran. But if an American company is registered offshore and has no American employees, it can trade with anyone it wants. During Dick Cheney's time as CEO, Halliburton had dozens of those foreign subsidiaries, including one in the Cayman Islands that, interestingly enough, dealt exclusively with Iran. Halliburton's address in the Caymans is at this bank, but there's no office here and no employees, just a mailbox. The bank manager says the company's mail gets rerouted to Houston, Texas, Halliburton's head office. This is designed to deceive, and that's what we see. Uh, it's what we've seen in Halliburton in so many ways. One of Halliburton's and Cheney's foremost critics in Washington is Democratic Senator Frank Lautenberg. He says any business with Iran is illegal, unethical, or both. We are at a virtual uh, confrontation level with Iran almost uh, at every moment, and to be looking for uh, uh, breaks in the law that permit him to pro permit them to profit uh, while uh, this uh, hostility is in front of us is unacceptable under any condition. And it wasn't just Iran. The year Cheney took over Halliburton, the company was fined almost four million dollars for selling products that could be used as nuclear triggers to Libya. And while he was CEO, Halliburton subsidiaries did more than seventy million dollars worth of business in Iraq at least some of which, experts agree, would have gone right into the pockets of Saddam Hussein. But when Cheney went back to Washington as vice president, those old business partners became the axis of evil. and carrying out massive state terror, uh, and in reward, uh, they're now fighting the war on terror. And, you know, the fact that Western intellectuals can look at this and not say anything, I mean, it requires, it is a really impressive testimonial to the discipline of educated people. And it's, it's a rather striking fact about the West. I don't know if anyone in Japan noticed it, but it's extremely dramatic. Actually, I just had a interview this afternoon with uh, German, uh, uh, a German, major German journal and pointed this out and pointed out to them, which they ought to know, that although the U.S. was the primary funder of Turkey, Germany was the second. Uh, what about that? You want to, everyone's worried about uh, stopping terrorism. Well, it's a really easy way. Stop participating in it. I mean, that alone will reduce the amount of terrorism in the world by an enormous quantity. Uh, it's true of just about every country that I know to varying degrees, but dramatically true for the U.S. and Britain and Germany and others. 
Texas to the Kerrville Folk Festival and hot air balloon races. And before we left Louisiana, some of those fine Cajuns what had moved over to Louisiana from Louisiana to Texas had come back and told Alan Fontenot and the whole band that, to be careful, watch all the road signs in Texas because in Texas, they said, they got some legalized motorcycle outlaws they called Texas State Troopers. So we were determined to obey all signs. We were going, taking turns driving the bus, got about to Houston, and Alan took over the controls and the rest of the band had a project in mind. They were going to teach me to play a game which I'd never heard of before, a game called Boure, which has got some intricate rules to it. For instance, um, Daryl, our drummer, told me that if you got a pair of nines on the second minute after midnight, you got to pay everybody double, providing it's an odd day of the week on the second Sunday of the month following Christmas on an odd year. And I said, well, that makes sense. But we stopped at a truck stop while they're telling me all this, and Alan's driving. Alan got off the bus to fuel up and take a little walk, and time went by, and we played cards. Hudson, our guitar player, happened to look at his watch, and he said, man, let me tell you something. You realize that Alan Fontenot had been took himself out of this damn bus for most an hour? He said, what? You know, he might have got mugged or something out there. Let's go look and see where he's at. All started to get off the bus, and we saw Alan coming back. Shirt over his shoulder, hot and dirty and looking upset. I said, Alan, what happened to you, man? He said, man, let me tell you something. I got to told you about this state of taxes. He said, they got a men's room over there, what you can damn near most park this bus sideways in and got some room left over to did whatever it was you were going to come in here to do in the first place. A big men's room, what I never seen again before my life. So, so, but where you been for an hour? He said, that's what I'm trying to tell you, my chef. He said, you see that damn big men's room over there? He said, I'll unclimb from this bus. And the first damn thing I saw was that huge sign which said, Clean restrooms. I thought I never would got done with that.